Hi everyone, great to see uh, so many familiar faces and uh, such a broad audience for what is going to be a fantastic talk. Um, we've got just some incredible insights coming into how some really pioneers of the organ world, which is some of you will know, some of you may be nearer to, is a, is a very specific, formerly a very male-dominated environment. And um, we're going to be hearing all about um, how these women have actually changed the whole landscape of the organ scene in the time of their careers. So um, great to see so many of you here. We just ask if you can keep yourselves on mute while the panelists are talking and then just pop any of the questions that you have in the chat and um, we will get around to them. I'll just make sure I can keep an eye on it. Um, so with that, I think I'd just like to get into our first panelist who is uh, Catherine Dinas Williams, who is the organist and master of the music at Guildford Cathedral, and um, is going to tell us about how she made her mark on that field of organ playing. Well, good evening, everybody. It's really great to see you. Um, I began playing the organ when I was 17 years old, was born in New Zealand. So that was my last year of secondary school. It was suggested to me that I should do that by my piano teacher, who herself was a Christian scientist who played the organ at the church in Wellington, New Zealand. And she thought it might be something I was interested in. So I just parked that piece of information, did nothing with it until I was 17 and had finished my piano diploma. So therefore felt I had the space to learn the organ. Um, and I learned the organ and took my diploma all within a year. So basically, I just completely fell in love with it and practiced, 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 practiced all the time. I was taught by a lady called Janet Gibbs. So I fitted that in around what you would call in the UK A-levels. Um, I then went to university and a lot of things fell into place for me at the right time. I knew somebody at my school who was a parishioner at Wellington Cathedral, and she told me they were developing their first ever organ scholarship. So I thought it might be a good idea to go for that because you could combine it with doing performance music at University in Wellington. I combined a music degree with an arts degree in French and German, which has been incredibly useful in my career in terms of having some languages uh, to speak when you go overseas to give recitals and know what people are talking about to you. Um, and uh, as things progressed, I was organ scholar at Wellington Cathedral, which had a fully choral tradition for three years. The third year of that, I was uh, the assistant organist because he had left. Uh, there was never any sort of question about my uh, gender at that point in time. I was able to do quite a lot in New Zealand. I was really grateful for that. There was literally just me playing the organ. So I got an awful lot of experience at a young age playing things like um, the... I think I played the Sanson in New Zealand, like when I was young, um, if I remember rightly, but as in symphony number no. three, I played the mass for double organ. I heard this amazing piece called Dieu Parmi Nou. I decided I'd spend nine months learning that um, and ruined everybody's hearing in the cathedral all afternoon. Um, and so, yeah, I just started learning a lot of repertoire, a lot of Anglican choral repertoire. Uh, the key thing for me was a Royal School of Church Music summer school in the summer of 1989. I was almost 19 years old, not quite, and um, there was somebody coming to direct the school called David Hill, whom I'd never heard of, didn't know who that was at all. Um, and I happened to have just written a mass setting at the time, so took that to the summer school, had some organ lessons, and he said to me, have you ever thought about coming to England to study? It's hard to explain to an audience um, when you're growing up in New Zealand and swanning around having a nice time and don't know much about anything over this side of the world, uh, how sort of bizarre that suggestion was, but indeed I took it up and I became organ scholar in Winchester in 1991. So, and then I became quite aware quite quickly of gender disparity. So I grew up in New Zealand where by then we had an ordained female bishop uh, in Dunedin and I arrived in England and everybody was having a big argument about whether women should be ordained priests in the first place. So I sort of didn't quite know what had hit me. It was quite a novelty factor that I was a woman in that working environment, but I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, this fantastic, amazing choir. Within six weeks, I was playing continuo 
in a performance of Messiah with a Baroque orchestra. Uh, I'd never done that in my life. We didn't have a Baroque orchestra in New Zealand in those days at all. I didn't know what one was, all those instruments in one place. So it was terrifying and it was awe-inspiring, but I sat with my notebook and I wrote every last thing down about the choir, about how it was directed, um, with organ playing, I asked David Hill, David Dunnett, to listen to my accompaniments quite a lot. And I learned repertoire. I just had a lot of organ music, which I had bought over the years. And I just sat and I learned it, didn't matter what it was. I just thought, I love it. I'm going to practice. I'm going to practice for hours and hours and hours and play it. Um, then I went to Liverpool, to the Roman Catholic Cathedral, which equally was great fun. Um, played the organ there for three years. I was the main assistant organist there, did a lot of playing, again, learned a lot of different repertoire. Then I went to Norwich as assistant organist and began to direct a girls choir when I was at Norwich. There were even more services at Norwich. Basically, I um, started to learn, you know, an awful lot of choral accompaniments, kept my solo playing alongside, started to do some work for the Royal School of Church Music, directing workshops, that kind of thing. Uh, then I went to Warwick, and uh, that's when um, I joined the Cathedral Organist Association, as it were, and was director of music at that particular parish church for seven years. And now I'm in Guildford, and this is my, gosh, I can't even count anymore. I've been here 13 years now, and every start of the academic year feels like a new birth. So I think to sum up, my career these days involves lots of different things, which I love. I'm not just the organist and master of the choristers here in Guildford. I also conduct the chamber choir. I also um, play regularly as an orchestral organist, if you like. I do some composing. Uh, I love conducting choirs. And I've had the great privilege and honour of being asked to direct and conduct different choirs around the world. Um, both for my own and as my own person, as it were, and for the Royal School of Church Music. And I've loved traveling. And I feel that's something that I've brought to my career as well, is a, a sort of a global perspective that everybody everywhere is just taking part in this wonderful same thing called music making. And I think uh, that's sort of where I'll leave my outline. Thank you very much. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, next, we're moving on to Anna Lapwood, who is the Director of Music at Pembroke in Cambridge, first organ scholar at Maudlin, and is also probably the, the highest profile organist who we have at the moment, just in terms of um, media, media penetration, lots of um, incredible stuff being done to bring awareness of the organ and what a typical organist looks like to a new audience. So we'll just hand over and let her tell us about that. Gosh, media penetration sounds rather painful. I am sorry. Uh <laughs> Hello, I'm Anna. Uh, I started the organ when I was in my sort of mid-teens. I started it sort of by accident. I had taken up loads of instruments when I was growing up and my mum said to me when I was, I think, about 14 or 15, she said, oh, have you thought about the organ? And I, as a teenage girl, stroppy teenage girl, said, no, don't be ridiculous, mum. I hate the organ. I don't want to take it up. And she then reminded me that some organ scholars get grand pianos in their room at Oxford or Cambridge. And that was the thing that swayed me. Um, I think when I first started the organ, I didn't fall in love with it straight away uh, because I found it really, really hard. And I think it was the first instrument, having taken up a lot of different instruments and being able to transfer skills quite quickly between them, it was the first instrument where I just, it seemed like there was no connection to the other instruments I was playing other than piano, obviously. So I found it quite hard, um, but that sort of made me want to tackle it even more and then I ended up getting an organ scholarship to Magdalen College Oxford and didn't quite know what I was letting myself in for there. Uh, I didn't realise that it was going to be quite as intense as it was uh, but absolutely loved my time there and it taught me a lot very fast. It was a sink or swim situation where I was playing for eight services a week having never accompanied a choir on the organ before. So it was a very, very steep learning curve. Um, but I think there's definitely something to be said for total immersion, if that makes sense. Just having to be surrounded by all this music the whole time, you, you learn it very quickly. And yeah, sink or swim. And uh, luckily I came out the other end really having fallen in love with the choral world in quite a serious way and deciding that that was something I wanted to do 
potentially for the rest of my life. So I then um, started applying for jobs, started not getting jobs, started getting very worried that I was about to be birthed into the world with no future, no career, no prospects. And then the Pembroke job came up and I thought, well, I'll just see what happens, um, see if they might take a chance on a 20, 20 year old uh, who has just come out of an organ scholarship. And they were brilliant and they did take a chance on me. And I have now been there for five years which I know makes Sarah wince. Uh, it's very, very strange, but I've had the most amazing time there. Learned a lot on the job. They have been uh, a very kind of nurturing environment. They've let me make my mistakes in uh, in private, if that makes sense. And it, yeah, it's taught me a lot about choir training um, and about teaching organists as well, helping our organ scholars as they come through. While at Pembroke, I've set up a girls choir. So we have a girls choir for girls aged 11 to 18 and uh, they're lovely and I adore them and several of them are now playing the organ which is always quite nice to see some of them really want to play the organ but their legs are so short I just don't think it's quite possible yet but it's nice to see that the uh, the willingness is there and then I guess the other sort of side of things aside from Pembroke um, well the two two other sides uh, I work as a broadcaster so I do tv presenting and radio presenting and I think it's so important to have organists doing things like that that take us out of the organ loft uh, and allow us to interact with other people in the rest of the world I think it's um, a, a real privilege and I really enjoy it and then I also uh, obviously play as a recitalist and play get to play organs sort of all over the place which is still a little bit terrifying it, the the, the nerve, nervousness around it never seems to go away but I, I love it and it, again it's such a privilege to have these concert halls and instruments to yourself and get to make them do what you want so that's me ah thank you that uh, brings us nicely on to sarah who's been at cambridge slightly longer at selwyn and uh i'm sure will impress us with stories of that um, right. Well, I, uh, like Catherine, am a foreigner. I'm, I'm Canadian uh, and I am a pianist by training. Um, when I got, I went to study in what's called the Glenn Gould School in Toronto uh, with the intention of being a concert pianist. And whilst I was there, I, I'm, I'm far too old to have been allowed to sing in cathedral choirs when I was growing up, but my brothers all were. Um, and I loved the music, but... Um, I knew I couldn't be involved because I was female. But when I got to Toronto, I was actually able to sing in um, a very good parish choir. Um, and I fell completely in love with the choral tradition. Uh, so I learned the organ because I, slightly randomly because I wanted to be a choral conductor. Um, so weird career path, but it was very much a, a kind of means to an end. Um, and. I made the rather rash decision to apply for a Cambridge Organ Scholarship after I'd only been playing for about eight months. Um, so I think the thing that swung it for me was was definitely was the choir practice that I did rather than my organ playing. Well, I think my trio was all right, but I can tell you for a fact that my sight reading was absolutely appalling. Um, and then spent the next year um, desperately scrabbling money together and actually trying to learn to play the organ. Um, and I came up uh, in 1992 to Robinson. Um, what was great about Robinson College was uh, that it was it's a very modern college. So um, all of the kind of uh, old world trappings of the University of Cambridge uh, weren't inflicted on me. And I found it difficult enough uh, finding out what formal hall was and all that sort of thing, um, let alone if I'd been at a college that was older than the country I grew up in. So I was very grateful, even though it doesn't look like my idea of a Cambridge college, I was very grateful to be there. I had en suite room all the way through. We have heating in the winter and air conditioning in the summer and all kinds of amazing modern conveniences. And also a really, really wonderful instrument. And that was when I fell in love with the organ, was that um, beautiful 26 stop Frobenius two manual tracker. And I'd never played anything I, I didn't think of the organ as being a touch sensitive in instrument until I played that for Venus. So I, then I really loved it. I also got to spend three, uh, two of my three years as senior organ scholar, which meant that I was actually conducting the choir most of the time, which was obviously what I wanted to do. I then went back to Canada for two years um, 
I'd had quite a lot of support from provincial and national governments for my degree. So I felt like I needed to contribute to the economy there. But it became apparent quite quickly that actually my the job I wanted to do just doesn't exist in North America, which is sad but true. I mean, it may be in a couple of places in the States, but, uh, but not in Canada. Um, and if I wanted to do the job I wanted to do more than just on a Sunday, like you want to do it five or six days a week, then you actually have to live in this country. So I will admit slightly reluctantly moved back here, uh, arrived, I mean, before Anna and Jocelyn were born, but um, I arrived on the, the day that Princess Diana was uh, killed. So I will never, ever forget that. Waking up with jet lag, a ridiculous hour in the morning, and my um, mother-in-law saying, the news is big this morning. So um, uh, anyway, I then spent a year doing what I would not be allowed to do now as a musician, but what every musician does, which is freelance, played as many weddings as I could, uh, you know, did some exams, did some teaching, did all kinds of stuff. And of course, as a foreigner, I wouldn't actually be allowed to have that kind of year. Um, but I then um, was going to go as an organ scholar to Chelmsford Cathedral, which I could do, keeping a lot of my Cambridge teaching and stuff. Only I rather foolishly fell off my bike and broke my collarbone, and I couldn't play the organ and I couldn't drive. And so I spent six months in actually quite a lot of discomfort. Uh, and the Selwyn job came up at that point. And I actually did conduct my audition with one arm in a sling. Um, luckily, you only need to beat time with the other one. <laughs> so, uh, and I was appointed to Selwyn in 1999. Um, and um, I've been here ever since. Um, it was very interesting. There were only in Cambridge when I first started, there were only about seven colleges that had directors of music. Now all but one have directors of music. But when I started, there were only seven or eight of us. And uh, the other seven, whatever it was, directors of music had all been supervisors of mine. So I already knew them all. Um, and I had studied, you know, counterpoint or history or whatever it was with them. And suddenly I was sitting around a table, um, at, at, you know, choosing choral scholars with, you know, the likes of Richard Marlowe and, uh, you know, sort of these eminent names. Um, and that was all a bit surreal. I think one thing that's been very fortunate for me, and I wouldn't be surprised as well for Catherine, is that actually English people have a tendency to pigeonhole each other as soon as you open your mouth. But actually, we can't be pigeonholed because we have weird accents. And so they can't tell what kind of school I went to. And they can't tell what my father's salary is. And they can't tell what kind of, you know, what kind of job I should be doing because they go, oh, weird, you're foreign, um, rather than, oh, strange, you're an organist and you're female. They, 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 the immediate thing is, that's weird, you're foreign, where are you from? And I wonder whether that's actually been a little bit in my favor. Maybe Catherine's, I don't know if Catherine feels that way, but certainly I've, I've sort of, I think I, I do think that has helped. Anyway, I've been at Selwyn for that long. And in 2010, I added the job of directing the girl choristers at Ely Cathedral to my portfolio. Um, and so I work too many hours a week because I also do quite a bit of composition. I like to do some playing when I can. I've made the foolish mistake of saying that I would play the Goldberg Variations in recital in five days time um, and um, do some examining for the RCO and I do quite a bit of teaching at Cambridge and various things. Um, but it's, it's all right. It's a kind of overly busy life, but I quite enjoy it. So there we are. Lovely, right, uh, which brings us, speaking of portfolioing, quite nicely on to Ghislaine, who is a recitalist, composer, and a teacher at Highgate, and uh, she's going to tell us about how she's come to combine those career strands. Thanks, Anya. Hi, everybody, lovely to be with you all. Um, so I first fell in love with music um, when I started singing and playing the piano in my local church. I was about four when I first started singing and absolutely loved it. And I was lucky that my uh, organist at my local church approached me and offered organ lessons for free. Um, and as soon as I started learning the organ, fell in love with it and played for services there, um, took on responsibilities at schools that I was at, playing for services, and got an organ scholarship to um, Wells Cathedral School, which is a music school. And it's also um, 
as the name suggests, it's got a cathedral attached. Um, so that was really wonderful. There were so many opportunities there to play, to work with other um, musicians. And I also went on lots of RCO courses as a teenager. I remember meeting Sarah on many occasions um, in those contexts and really enjoyed those. And uh, in my sixth form years, my teacher, who was director of music at Wales Cathedral, created um, the junior organ scholarship for me. Um, so while I was at school, I was really lucky to be able to play for services, normally sort of three services a week, and immerse myself in cathedral music um, for the first time then, which I absolutely loved. I also trained the choristers and conducted the choir from time to time. I then um, had a gap year at Guildford Cathedral with Catherine, um, who was very inspiring as a female role model for me. And then I went on to be organ scholar at Christchurch Cathedral in Oxford. Um, and I met Anna there uh, because Anna and I were the two female organ scholars at Choral Foundations at that time. So we'd meet for coffee from time to time. And I loved being at Christchurch. It was very intense. Um, we had eight services a week, but it was a wonderful grounding in playing and um, choir training. And of course, I really enjoyed the degree as well. Um, and during that time, I gained my FRCO. And then following my time at Christchurch, I decided to train as a teacher. And so I moved to London and I've worked for the past six years as a music teacher. Um, and I'm currently at Highgate School. So there my roles really varied. I teach academic music, I teach organ and I conduct choirs. Um, I also still play a lot. Um, so I give recitals around the country. And in recent years, I've been doing more and more composition. So I'm um, published with three publishers and really enjoy taking on commissions. I write organ and choral music. And definitely my experiences in cathedral music have have informed me as a composer because obviously I've played a lot of music, I've heard so much music, um, it's definitely influenced my style and made me confident to be able to compose. Um, and then SWO has been a really big part of the last few years as well. So Anne and I um, are co-chairs of SWO and that's been really rewarding. Um, we're delighted with how it's developed and yeah, wonderful to run events like this and um, tackle the gender imbalance in the organ world. So that's my story. Great, thank you so much. And that of course brings us to Anne, who is a titan of the organ teaching establishment. She's been uh, teaching and publishing books and running courses, um, which from all these talks we've heard are so important in sort of developing organists. Um, so we can hear how she came to have such an effect. Thank you, Anya. Uh, lovely to see everybody this evening. Um, my story, of course, is very different, not least because I am by far the oldest member of the panel. And so there was I growing up in the 1950s and 60s, which was an extremely different uh, society compared with what we have now. So I was introduced to the organ by a family friend at about the age of 12. Um, and the one message I remember he gave me was it was a very difficult instrument, <laughs> which is not a, a very positive way to start, but um, I was hooked nevertheless. Um, I didn't start learning until I was about 16, and I had a teacher who was um, encouraging, um, encouraged me to take diplomas, um, not, of course, to go for um, music as a career, perish the thought, um, in those days. Um, but nevertheless, I practiced hard, I enjoyed myself. Um, and then it came to the point when I was um, getting ready to leave school. And I was really lost because there was careers advice in school um, and we girls were offered teaching. Uh, no, thank you. Not at that stage. Didn't appeal. Nursing. Definitely not. Working in an office. Oh, boring. Um, so I left school not knowing at all what to do. Um, there were no role models in my part of the society anyway, um, no female role models in professions. Of course, there were some women, 
working professions at that point. Of course, there were, but they weren't household names. And I certainly hadn't heard of them. My parents expected me to get married, have children, um, be a housewife. Um, so it was quite a confusing time. So anyway, I worked for, um, I think it was four years, took music diplomas in my spare time. Um, and as, as the results came back, I thought, well, this is really a bit silly. You know, maybe I am good enough to do music um, um, as uh, what I then decided I wanted a career. I um, did I say that um, girls at that stage were always being asked, are you going to get married or are you going to have a career? It was one or the other. So um, I, I reached a point when I thought, well, look, it really doesn't matter um, if I don't make it as any kind of musician, but I really want to study music full time. So I applied to the academy and I got in. I was that much older. I had diplomas already and therefore performance opportunities came in. Um, I took them. I thought, this is fun. I'm enjoying this. So uh, after I left, I carried on doing a lot of recitals, um, traveled about a bit, um, took on some teaching. Um, and so this was now the 19, where are we, 1970s, 80s. And of course, society was changing. I started reading some feminist books and women's liberation um, was established in the 1970s in this country. Um, it was a time of great change. And of course, the organ world was also changing. And it was absolutely clear that there was a lot of work to be done in the organ world. Um, there was not much teaching going on. Um, there was a nil communication between potential students, potential teachers. Um, publications were at a very low ebb, there'd been nothing much published for a long time, and um, the publications, the um, anthologies and tutor books weren't recognising um, all the um, uh, musicology um, organology that um, had been um, so vivid in other countries. Um, well, my parents were wonderful, they didn't encourage me to have a career, but they did encourage me to tackle a problem head on. Uh, to um, find practical solutions to things. So um, es essentially, I wrote books, wrote compiled anthologies. I um, decided that there were far too few organists, but far too many organizations serving them. And why didn't we organizations get together? And so that led to National Learn the Organ Year. Um, which revealed that actually there were loads of people wanting to learn the organ, but the communication between students and teachers was poor. So that led to National Organ Teachers Encouragement Scheme. I think Simon Williams, yes, hello, Simon. Um, he was very instrumental in those two movements as well. Um, and so it went on from there. On the back of that, I established St. Giles International Organ School. Um, the first classes I, uh, I expected to have six students, but 30 applied. That's for beginners. Um, and then we expanded the team of teachers. Um, we soon got up to hundreds of students. It was an extraordinary time. Um, and it was wonderful work to do. Um, and I felt I was very lucky to live at that point when this work that I was enjoying so much um, was waiting to be done. Um, I was also very lucky to be appointed director of music organist at St. Giles Crookgate Church with its lovely organ. Um, I'm still there 39 years later. Um, and I, like the other speakers, love the choir training and I very much appreciate um, ready access to an organ to play. Um, so the, there's always been lots of work to do. There's still lots of work to do despite my great age. Um, and I just feel lucky to be doing it. Amazing. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, really incredible range of stories and experiences from all of those. And I think one thing that's really come out from that is the important, particularly from Anne's um, sort of account, which has tied everything up quite nicely with the idea of expectations, which obviously have been so important in terms of, you know, not just for girls or women organists to envision how they could make a career out of it. But I think everyone on the panel being pioneers in this in this sense has really gone out of their way to to change those expectations and shift them so um we're going to move into some questions for this part now if anyone wants to pop anything on the chat or just stick your hand up we'll keep an eye out but uh just to kick things off um one of the sort of interesting other things that i was coming up a lot was this idea of 
falling in love with organ or falling in love with music and having this moment where you realize that it really is sort of the thing that you want to do, that you want to dedicate your life to. And then sort of an interesting counterpart to that, I was thinking, Catherine mentioned that she sort of wasn't conscious of this gender issue before she came to the UK. So just as a sort of counterbalance to the moment where you fell in love with the organ, sort of does the panel have any thoughts on like the moment where they did become conscious of a gender issue or gender disparity? Personally, I think I was aware when I was a teenager that there was a, a there was a big gender imbalance. I remember certainly being on courses and often being the only girl um, and being really aware of that. Um, it wasn't that people commented on it, but I was just very conscious of that. And when there were female role models there, you know, as star, that that made a huge difference to me. It really encouraged me and inspired me. Um, I was going to say a similar thing. I remember being one of the uh, very few uh, female organists on courses, but I also remember when I sort of eventually decided to apply for an organ scholarship, being told, oh, well, you can't apply to a foundation because you're female. And I think, but it was by someone who just worked in foundations and he sort of, it wasn't a rule, but it was just assumed almost. And I remember that was the first time I went, hang on a minute, what? Because I thought it was a bit odd that I played the organ just because I thought it was a strange instrument, not because because of gender or anything like that. So for me, that was probably my eye, eye opening moment. I think for me, when I um, mentioning, you know, when I came to England, because I'd been in such a supportive environment in New Zealand and suddenly I was on my own, 12,000 miles from home, I knew absolutely nobody. Um, and a, a key moment for me actually was when I was 10 years old and my parents, whom as I grow older, I realised were extraordinary people because they took me out of school as a 10 year old and uh, took me to Europe with them because my mother had work to do. So we traveled all over Europe and England. So I saw places that I would then learn about in my education through secondary school. And so I was in a, I think some people might know the story, but I was in a, the church in Helsinki, the cathedral there, and somebody was playing the organ. And I was utterly, that was my a light bulb moment. I fell in love at that moment with that sound. I refused to leave the building and we missed a train because I would not leave. I was so stubborn about that. So, but then when I came to England, it was just sort of little things, you know, reflecting backwards. Um, Sarah mentioned, you know, the notion of being foreign and people, uh, of course, from a media perspective, uh, in terms of my appointment, one, I was a woman, two, I was from New Zealand. It was always that, and they were regarded as curiosities and absolute sort of media tags and so I think, and when I went to Liverpool and I was working in a Roman Catholic environment, but I was a, con, a baptized and confirmed Anglican, that then added a third thing. So I was, became, I became more and more conscious that I was regarded as weird and different. And, uh, you know, there were some darker, there have been a lot of darker moments in my career for me as a woman, which I wouldn't wish to discuss or share. But I, I think you, you need to acknowledge that. And the really important thing is that that makes you who you are and that makes you part of who you are and, and gives you just the love to keep going and to share this. And one of the things that I'm enjoying so much uh, these days is teaching other people. And, you know, I was just sort of uh, thinking of Jizzy there and how much I enjoyed having her here as organ scholar. And we've got new organ scholar who was Sarah's organ scholar last year. And um, I, I just love that continuity and, and teaching young people to love the instrument as much as I do. It's funny, I, I think the first time I realised that what I was put here for was not open to me was when we lived in Calgary, which at the time had a very good men and boys tradition. And my father and two brothers were allowed to sing in the choir and I was not. And I, I, I was completely baffled by it. You know, it just it just didn't make any sense. Um, and I but I guess, I, you know, I was I would have been about eight or nine years old and I you're just like oh that's how that's how life is that seems very strange but that's how it is but I didn't really think about it again until I remember the I I chaired the um organ scholarships here in Cambridge and I remember my first meeting and sitting down and that was when you know that I 
all of the colleges were appointing a, a, an organ scholar. And so there, there were, you know, there's sort of, at that point, there would have been nine or 10 directors of music, plus another nine or 10 deans and chaplains, and a few um, admissions tutors as well. And we sat down, and it was my very first examiner's meeting, we sat down, and you know how you start a meeting and you say, ladies and gentlemen, and I realized I didn't need the first word. I just said, gentlemen, because I was the only non-man in the room and it was fine we were all wearing our gowns and it was all a bit kind of like pretending I was on Brideshead Revisited or something but um and I, I wasn't I wasn't intimidated by it but it did sort of it did strike me as slightly strange we covered that topic okay fab. um Carla asks it took me three months to come forward as a volunteer organist at the local Catholic Church in Dagenham why well, perhaps I will um, uh, contribute to the last discussion. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, no, no, it was entirely <laughs> my fault. I, I I, I, well, I was thinking two contradictory things, so I thought I probably wouldn't say anything very clear. Um, the first thing was that when I went to the academy, there were quite a few, I've forgotten how many, but there were quite a few other girls studying the organ. That's not the case now. So I'd love to do a close study of what happened during the late 19th century when there were lots of women learning the organ, playing the organ in this country, um, and now. For myself, um, I kind of accepted as I was growing up that there were girls' jobs and boys' jobs. <laughs> so I can't say I was surprised by uh, the gender imbalance. But when I started to feel it mattered hugely was when I started teaching, and I noticed that the girls were much more um, needing encouragement and their confidence boosting than the boys who were um, almost always more determined um, and ambitious. So, and I, I, frankly, I haven't seen that change a great deal. Um, and it was Carla's comment here that reminded me of that. Girls don't put themselves forward as much as um, I, I wish they would. If I can just chime in there and say, um, it's in recent years that I said to David Hill, so why did you, why did you actually choose me? Because you knew that in, in those circumstances that I was coming to uh, Winchester Cathedral then as a female. And he said to me, his answer back was very clear. He said to me, because you were so persistent and you were so determined. And when I went to Winchester, I made a series of kind of comedy home videos to send home to New Zealand because Remember, my, I had left my parents behind. My father thought I should be a lawyer. My mother told my father that is not what I wanted to do and that I should pursue what I loved doing. So, you know, I, I sort of arrived over here. And when I look at those home videos now, and I was only reflecting on this in the last six months when I was preparing a workshop for somebody else, and I saw that in myself, age 21, and it was kind of a remarkable thing to see my questioning, my asking. I'm very wide-eyed and bushy-tailed, but nonetheless, I asked the questions and thought nothing of it. Good for you, Catherine, an example to us all. Again, just the idea of what a typical woman organist could look like has, has definitely developed, even if maybe it hasn't translated into quite enough self-belief as compared to, compared to male organists, maybe, but I suppose definitely progressing. Sorry, can I just hop on? Hi, you just yes, that. please do. Uh, yeah, I think one of the things that pe uh, people so often say to me is they say, oh, well, there are loads of female organists now. Uh, we've sorted it. It's problems, problem solved. What, what are you banging on about? And I think that, that there have been so many fantastic female organists throughout history. And I think the issue is that they're seen as the exception. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be the fact that they're seen as the exception because there are so many fantastic female organists around. And it's, you see it with organ scholars and when, I mean, when I was applying for organ scholarships and I told people I was going for Magdalene, they kind of did that and thought, what? It, it, that is what we need to change. We need to make it so that you're not surprised when a woman is good. Sorry, that's my rant over. Oh, excellent, excellent rant. <laughs> exactly, I mean, there are, there are clear signs of progress in that direction which is something. Ah, William asks, what can be done from the other side of things? How can men help women into the organ world? Is there any advice on how others can try to fix this? Can I, can I pipe in here? Two things <laughs> which are relevant to the past 48 hours. Men who are teachers, please don't ask your female 
students to play in a more masculine way because that's not helpful. It's it's completely unnecessarily lazy gendered shorthand. Come up with what's actually what you actually think is missing. Be careful when you say that sort of thing. And double check when you've copied and pasted a, a letter <laughs> or an email to somebody. Double check the pronouns because they might not be right. That was just two hours ago, quite consciously about a female organist, but it was obviously a copied and pasted email and all the um, pronouns were masculine. And it's fine. I know that most organists are men, but you've got to be more careful than that. I think encouraging any young musician that you come across to play the organ is, is a really important thing. I'm a great one for just randomly walking up to my choristers and telling them that they are going to play the organ. And they go, am I? And I go, yes, you are. We're going to start lessons. Come on, take me to your parents. And so it's a bit kind of full on, but also they get quite interested quite quickly. And of course, they're in an environment in a cathedral church where they're hearing the organ played all the time. So we can refer to it. We can, you know, model good performance, good playing. Or we can talk about the repertoire we play. So it's just that beginning those conversations and those dialogues with people and then allowing them access. Now, nothing infuriates me more in the cathedral world than fellow colleagues who don't let people play their instruments. What the heck are they there for if we're not actually letting people play them at all? Uh, I completely understand and get because it's in the day job that, you know, one has to deal with insurance and risk assessments and safeguarding. But get through that. You've got to get through that so that people can actually have access to and play instruments. There's nothing more exciting for a group of school children coming into the, the building on a cathedral visit than actually having that instrument demonstrated to them. They really love it. It's we've got an easy sell. The organ sells itself. You know, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful instrument, but we just need to be those communicators, those people encouraging people to actually do that and thinking and recreating ways constantly. So we can't sit still. We can't just say, OK, this is good now. We've got to this place and this is happening and so and so is doing this and so and so is doing that. It's we've always got to be thinking, what next? How can we encourage more people? How can we help them to feel confident in coming forwards and having a go? And of course, critically, how can we tell people that they learn the most from making mistakes? I'm just going to shepherd this line of discussion along the direction of the questions that Frederick and Simon have, have thrown out, which are wondering if there are any differences you could pinpoint about what women bring to organ performance compared to men and whether, since most cathedrals have girls' choirs enough or many girls' choruses are learning the organ. I think the differences between various organists of either gender are much more extreme than um, between the genders. That's to say there's much more variation overall. Um, I don't think, I've never found in teaching um, and indeed listening to recitalists that women play differently from men. They're good organists and bad organists in my experience. <laughs> yeah, I remember um, Anne saying in a talk a while ago that she thought that the playing that organists have much more um, is about their character as a person rather than their gender, which I thought I absolutely agreed with. I think um, to answer the question about girls learning the organ, in my experience, one of the issues is that because a number of, you know, a lot of the girls' choirs, they the girls go a little bit later, you know, they may finish at 15 or 16 rather than 12 or 13. It's very common for boys when their voices start to change to think, oh, I still want to be involved, what can I do? I know, I'll go up and start turning pages. Oh, I quite like the looks of this, I'll start playing the organ. Whereas girls, as they head, head into their early teens, uh, their voices start to develop a bit because they don't really change as, as obviously and they don't change really usually until they're 14 or 15. So they start getting really good at singing. So they don't necessarily want to take up a new instrument. And then they get to 14 or 15, they get kicked out of their girls choir, rightly so, but suddenly they're like, oh, GCSEs, I better not take up a new instrument. So it wouldn't surprise me if, I mean, certainly in my experience at Ely, there are 
usually more boys, um, especially the ones whose voices change in year seven, year eight, you know, and then in year nine, they miss singing, so they take up the organ. Whereas the girls tend to need to be encouraged a little bit more. And I tend, I have my eye on a couple of them, but it takes more arm twisting in some cases, in my experience. I think that links to what we were saying earlier about what Anne, Anne said about girls generally being less confident, which is definitely something I've found with my teaching. And of course, like the organ being <sighs> often a very grand, imposing looking instrument in a building, I think that can scare some girls off who, who do feel less confident because, you know, it makes a loud noise as well. All of these factors, I think, can put people off even though, as we know, the organ can be very sensitive and, and beautiful. I think that's part of the reason I think gendered spaces can actually be really important in this. I mean, I think SWO and I think, I mean, Sarah and I have been doing this Cambridge organ experience for girls and you see 45 young women turning up really wanting to have a go. And yeah, I think obviously mixing young people is very important too, but in the context of something like this, where there can be nervousness to come forward because, or oh, is, it, is it really for me? Am I allowed in here? Having a space where it's just them and they can have a go and feel safe to do so is a really important thing. So, I mean, we have a lot of questions in the chat sort of asking about these threats or advantages uh, that come from the organ, which I have to say, I'm really enjoying this discussion because I career out of selling people insights on these things because I went into from from organ and from seeing the range of things that people do or things that people bring to the role, I started selling that to people for politics reasons. So this is very helpful and thank you to everyone. Um, the sort of interesting question from both from Helene and from Hannah about how it is to be a sort of woman professional and their strengths and weaknesses that you might feel with the organist's role in family or personal life because of the hours and then from Helen asking whether as a female you're able to create more balance between sort of stronger and weaker students and opportunities. I think it, it's a big problem isn't it and it's an increasing problem um, especially for organists who play on Sundays. If you have a partner you need a very understanding partner. I'm lucky to have one um, and I know others here have um, equal good fortune but it is one of the challenges we face however it's, it's it's not such a big challenge that people should be deterred because there are solutions so yes but don't be put off by it i'm not really qualified to address that particular issue because i don't have any work-life balance um and the second that <laughs> and i don't have any children so um that yeah <laughs> sorry i mean i yeah I just popped in the chat that I said I didn't practice in depth at all for my daughter's early years. I can say that categorically, but I relied on the, the bank of practice that I'd done for years and years before that. And I probably played quite badly sometimes along the line, but yeah, that's all about boundaries and work-life balance. And for me, she and my husband came first every time because there's always music uh, that's a choice that I made consciously however I would say of course that you know having a joyful family life of course impacts your music making so perhaps Frederick that's answering your question a little bit in the chat about is there anything that you know as a woman you feel you bring to organ playing specifically but I say that sort of as a human rather than a, than as a as a woman if I may I think Frederick's also asked an interesting question saying, is it ever an advantage to be in a minority? I think that could be quite an important thing to touch on. I mean, if, speaking from personal experience, I know that I've got a lot of uh, concerts and gigs, for want of a better word, and jobs for, because, I, because I'm female and I stand out. Um, it doesn't mean it's necessarily been an easy ride, uh, far from it. But yes, I'm sure I've got those opportunities um, because I'm female. I hope that at some point, it won't be because the organist is female, it will be because they're a good player. I don't think we're there yet. And I think what we have a responsibility to do is try and get it closer to just being about the music making, because that's what we're all here for, isn't it? It's it, That's not unrelated to um, it was one of my favourite comments of like, sort of quotations ever. Um, so the whole thing about, you know, well, we we need a woman on the panel or we need a woman on the board or we whatever, we need a female organist. and. 
Pache to all of the men in the room because I know most of you personally and you are very good friends. But this was from the great uh, Madeleine Albright who said, we know that true equality will have been achieved when there are just as many mediocre women in the room as there are mediocre men. But it does hark back to William Bishop's question. Um, and that's so lovely. How, do, how can men help to address the gender balance? And obviously we're speaking to the converted here, the, the, the men that have joined the group tonight. Um, so thank you for your support. But yes, it is a question of giving women work, isn't it? So unless those organising the recitals or other opportunities give work to women, the balance won't be adjusted, it won't become more normal. So I would say encouragement, give each other work, and it's so important for we women in a position to hand out work, to look for other women. It's, it's so easy just to look for the person you last heard play or, or, or the chap around the corner. I think we all need to make a big effort to give work to women so that we're, the women are more visible. And I guess that's such an important role that SWO has to play, um, just building on the networks of mentors or role models or supporting this sense of self-belief that, and you are saying, you noticed is absent. Are there any other questions? Somebody, with his hand, somebody called Robert with his hand up. I don't know if he's on your screen. Um, if, if he has his hand up, please, could he unmute himself? Because... If I could just comment, uh, I'm very pleased I joined this evening's uh, event. Not wanting to give my age away, I am in excess of uh, three score years and ten. So I have seen a great uh, change in life uh, between male and female worlds. And I have to say that um, uh, I have nothing but admiration for tonight's speakers. Um, if I could also just comment that we in Kent, which is where I live, um, organise an organ competition and we would love to see more female entrants. Uh, the details will be on our um, website around about November. Uh, we we do have female entrants, but we'd like to see more. So if, if you're able to influence the situation, that would be great because we're on your side. Thank you for um, bringing that up. I'm sure if you want to pop any details in the chat or um, I'm going to put the SWO website in the chat now to remind everyone that if you want to join any more SWO events like this, get this sort of keep track of the newsletter, any of the teaching opportunities, networking opportunities that SWO organises. The website is there. Please join um, as a member. And we have the Society of Women Organists Youth Group on Facebook, which is really meant to encourage young women organists to get in touch with each other, get in touch with mentors, and just find more events. Not too much pressure, just really learn more if, if you want to. Uh, and we do have one last interesting question from Ginny which I was asking if the, the organ world tends to pit women organists against each other, which seems like an appropriately salty note to leave the discussion on. Gosh, I hope not. I've never been aware of it. And it's something that used to be said, oh, women hate each other. And um, I've never experienced that. And I think it's absolute rubbish. And the more often than we say so, the better. <sighs> Anyone want to dissent? Anyone want to, <laughs> want to dispute our opinion on that? Well, if you agree with me, um, the most powerful thing we can do is just make sure that we make SWO a big, growing, effective, energetic and positive body. So if you're not a member, everybody, please join male, female, whatever, any age, any level of organ playing expertise. We want you in the movement because it's really strengths in numbers. Well, um, I've just put a link to um, our page with details of how you can join. So thank you for mentioning that, Anne and Anya. And um, thank you very much to all of our wonderful panellists for joining us tonight and um, being so generous with your time. We, we really appreciate it. And I'm sure you can see it's been re really valuable for everybody involved to, to hear about your story and your experiences. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming and um, have a lovely evening.